long time, then working slowly. The right thing to do at this time is gathering the right information and upgrading skills for future prospects while taking care of health is the way forward during pandemic and post-pandemic phase. The international webinar, SOFI 2020, Sustainable Ornamental Fisheries, Way Forward, focus on potential avenues in ornamental fisheries to provide appropriate perspectives towards sustainable ornamental fisheries. The way forward to sustainable ornamental fisheries is the focal theme of SOFI. Yes. Uh, Tim, the live streaming will start in two, three seconds. I will tell you, start, yeah, we, we will start with that. So today, today we are supposed to have uh, Mike Chakinadi from USA talking about market trends in ornamental fish hobby in USA. Before moving on to the talk, let me just introduce Mike Chakinadi. He has not joined for the time being. Well, Just waiting for the live stream to start, Tim. Okay. So is is Mike no. going to be on uh, or not? No, no, no. I'm just in, uh, telling his uh, bio data. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, we'll uh, just talk about that and then can you explain. So, Professor Kuru, uh, uh, you are there. Can you hear yeah. me? Ah, yeah. ah, <laughs> early today. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome. So, we were just telling about our morning. Uh, our uh, who is speaking next? Our first speaker. Uh, his place is affected by thunderstorm things. So, we just going to have some discussions, general ornamental fish discussions. So this is a discussion session? Yes, sir. Uh, because that was an unexpected thing. Mm. <clears throat> People are just joining in. Waiting for five more minutes. Today we also have Gayatri Lilly and uh, John Doss, two talks. Did, did John speak this morning? No, or, uh, today, uh, later, 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 later part of the day. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, morning for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your morning, sister. Your, your sister. Tomorrow, early yes. tomorrow morning, yeah. Hope you'll join. You'll join, right? Uh, I will try. <laughs> it's early. Okay, I mean, these will finish up. Yeah, these will finish up about one thirty in the morning, my time, and then I will. I'll try to get up for the the, the next ones in the morning. Yes. Okay. So today uh, we were supposed to have a uh, Michael Chekinari from USA. Uh, he was supposed to speak about market trends in ornamental fish hobby in USA. So Mike Chikinadi is with his background spanning retail, wholesale and aquarium fish import and export. Mike Chikinadi began working at a local fish store in his early teens and has been following the fish ever since. After a stint in Florida, working for a major importer and tropical fish farm, Mike has traveled through much of Asia and South America visiting aquarium fish exporters, collectors and fish communities. 
He's worked with aquarium fish specific conservation organizations like Project Fireba and the IUCN Hope Aquarium Fish Subgroup, HAFSHSG, and has written extensively on wild capture fisheries for both hobbyist based and general public media outlets. Mike resides in Boulder, where he operates an aquarium fish import business and is a senior editor and associate publisher for the English language Amazonas magazine. So welcome to all of you to the second day of SOFI 2020, Sustainable Ornamental Fisheries Way Forward. Well, uh, Mike Chakinadi has not joined for the time being. Uh, his place has been affected by a bad windstorm. Uh, uh, so he's not joined. Uh, for the time being, uh, we'll have some discussions on ornamental fisheries aspects. Over to you, Tim Miller Morgan from USA. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just I'm sort of stepping in here. Um, I'm Dr. Tim Miller Morgan. I'm um, I work for Oregon State University and um, on the executive board of Ornamental Fish International. I'm a veterinarian. Um, and you'll hear from me on on uh, Friday, uh, or you'll hear from me tomorrow, um, talking about a program we've developed here. Uh, but what uh, I thought we could do is maybe um, I'm going to put up a question in the chat. And you know, you've had you've had a couple uh, talks. You know, it's fine, and and uh, Shane Willis and and uh, Paul um, earlier. And what I thought is. You know, they've discussed some of the important issues. We've talked about CITES, talked about biosecurity, invasive species. So what we thought we'd do is maybe put up this question here and have people chime in. You could either chat or um, um, uh, whoever's managing this could actually, you could raise your hand and then you could unmute yourself um, and, uh, and and make it a, a, a comment. But what I thought the question that we'd address is, you know, what are some important emerging issues for the industry that might not have been discussed already? So, um, you know, we have a few few of the previous speakers here that could chime in, but it would be really interesting maybe to get a little discussion going and have people, um, you know, just give us give us kind of their um, impressions of the industry today and what are some important issues that um, maybe we should think about addressing uh, if we're not already and I will turn it over for some discussion. So feel free to put a comment in the chat and I'll read it out to everyone. Um, or again, I'm not moderating, but if you wanted to um, raise your hand or uh, put a thumbs up sign in your, um, in your picture, somebody could then um, activate your, your mic so that you could speak. All of us can speak, Karen, Karen, joining, she's joined, Kapila. They've all joined, you can all speak, unmute. Yep. Uh, admin, can we have an unmute for Karen, Kapila, Karen Gaynor, Kapila Tissera? Since oh, we're going on a, yeah. yeah. Spain, unmute. Could we unmute? Admin, could you unmute all this people so that we can have a hi, Mini and hi. Tim. Yes. Hello. Good evening, or morning, or afternoon. <laughs> it's uh, almost getting to afternoon now. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Nice to see you after quite some time. Yes, it has been a while. Yes, yes, it's been a while. Um, well, we are, these days, Tim, we I'm uh, basically uh, interested in uh, diseases in the marine fish, captive bred marine fish sector, especially in mm -hmm. uh, early fry rearing, early rearing stages. Are you seeing disease problems in that area? Uh, I do, I do, because. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a time when our UV was not working and we used to lose a lot of uh, nursery stuff 
uh, like on the third, fifth day. And mm -hmm. uh, I have found some protozoans uh, on these bodies uh, of the dying fish, uh, but could not identify them. Uh, like uh, I used to do those days, I will try to send you some uh, uh, images or videos of that digital. Uh, so that oh, yeah. uh, we can. That would be uh, great. I've been, yeah, I've been able also to like uh, control it uh, with uh, like 15 ppm formalin. Mm -hmm. um, but it keeps on recurring uh, um, uh, till uh, so now what I have done is till the UV bulbs are repaired or done something I'm uh, collecting the seawater and um, uh, the night before I uh, disinfect them with uh, with chlorine and use them in the next next day. Mm -hmm. Use the seawater after sea water, yes, yes. disinfection. Yes, yes. Yeah. We have uh, 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 placed very close to like uh, 50, 50 feet away from the sea. So mm -hmm. we are using it directly, but uh, we used to use it through sand and UV filtering. But uh, uh, when the UV lights had to be replaced, we, we were slowly uh, getting more and more problems like this. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I will definitely send you some, some uh, video clips on that. Yeah, I would be really interested to see that. And I have a couple of parasitologists I work with really closely at the university that uh, uh, I can send them to. They're always excited to see something new. All right. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Oh, thank you. Good Good to hear from you. Capella. Yeah, I think we, are, we still have the shared uh, uh, folder in my, in my uh, uh, OneDrive with you. I'll send an, oh. another link to you. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. That's the one we were using for the Singapore meeting? Yes. A meeting yes. and then I, later on I sent, a, sent you a lot of video clips, uh, some video clips on what we, whatever I found in the farms. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Any other uh, comments, questions? Um, Again, you know, are are there some emerging issues that maybe you're seeing that that really weren't addressed um, in the talks the other day? Uh, Tim, good morning or good afternoon to you. Uh, as a veterinarian, uh, uh, we hear we hear a lot on on one health uh, idea on. We're all interconnected uh, on this planet. Um, your opinion on this? I don't want to. I don't want to start with your talk. Actually, uh, I'll have more <laughs> your your impression on this for regarding ornamentation, one health, Senegal, Sudan, Sudan. Uh, so, so what? What's my impression about one health and ornamental fish? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I, the concept of One Health is is that, you know, there are there are health interactions between the environment, the animals, and even the human population, and um, and the idea is that we we look at we look at these things more holistically. So, you know, you change if you start off it with in the wild. If you change the environment, you can potentially if you change it in a negative fashion, you can potentially impact the animals themselves, which then may result in um, impacts on humans as well. So we look at, you know, in certain certain rainforest areas, when you have uh, deforestation, you're moving animals closer to the human populations. So you're potentially transferring diseases that have only been seen in the animal populations into humans um, or vice versa. I mean, there've been some situations where they've documented um, human disease is actually showing up in primates. So one health is the idea of looking at all of that together. I think from the standpoint of, of aquarium fish, I think where we really want to look at it is the impact on, especially when we're dealing with wild collection or um, aquaculture of those fish in wild environments or in the environment, not land-based recirculating is the interactions between the environment, the facilities, and the, the process of rearing those animals, um, or the diseases that some of those animals may carry that could 
move into from the wild that could move into uh, the ornamental fish production facilities or some of those some of some of these ornamental fish and we did a paper on it a, a, a while ago where we looked at zo potential zoonotic diseases and zoonotic diseases are diseases that animals can carry that can transfer to humans and there are a number of them that our aquarium fish can carry and um, one of the things that's really interesting is we've actually seen some of these mostly they're bacterial pathogens um, some of these kind of unique ones show up in ornamental fish that we haven't seen before. And, you know, what is the impact there and how is that occurring? You know, how are, how are these animals picking up these potential disease agents and what is the risk to people that are working with those fish? And so I'm not, I hope, hopefully this is making sense by trying to answer those questions. We're not only looking at how we're rearing the fish, how we're doing the husbandry, but also what kind of precautions we're taking, but also the impact in the environment, not necessarily that impact that the aquarium fish industry is having, but other environmental effects that are occurring that may impact those fish and subsequently impact the diseases that may move into the trade or, um, and then potentially into humans or into other fish. You know, one of the big concerns I know in, in Australia, and if Shane is on here, he could probably talk about it more, is the concern of some diseases flowing from the aquarium fish industry into wild fish that have really um, significant economic value um, from the standpoint of a food fish or culturally. Okay. Does that kind of, yeah. does that get at what you're looking at, looking for? Yeah. Uh, well, I, from a personal perspective, I've, I've seen uh, uh, from in a wholesale company uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, mycobacterium uh, was an issue. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, on, on, on the group of people working within the company, the, the chances of catching mycobacterium was very slim. It but is. It, the, if you have it, it is it is a bit of a, an issue, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so the company uh, uh, implemented a protocol, a strict protocol of uh, washing your hands a number of times a, a day, disinfecting your hands uh, with alcohol a number of times a day. And then the problem human-wise of transmitting uh, from, from fish to humans uh, uh, just went away. We didn't see any problems years after afterwards anymore. Uh, but I, I wonder how big of an issue is this? Do we do we know anything uh, on this uh, on a world scale? Is it in, in uh, people working daily with fish uh, in in Southeast Asia or in Canada or in the United States? Uh, do we often see these problems? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it's. It's common, but it does occur. If you look in the human literature, there are there are a number of reports of not only mycobacterium but other other infections that do occur. I would say it's rare. It's not, I'm not suggesting anyone panic, but good personal hygiene is really the key. Um, but we do see it. We see mycobacterium, and I'll come back to that in a minute too, because there's some really interesting information on myco that's come out. Um, in the last few years. But we've also seen Aeromonas infections. We've seen Pseudomonas infections that can be traced back to fish. Um, there's, I've actually pulled, um, I've, I've, there's, oh, Vibrio. Vibrio, um, you know, certainly we, we pull out of fish and they can cause problems. The greatest risk though is, is to individuals that are in some way immunocompromised. So if you're healthy and you're using and you're using good personal hygiene, washing your hands, disinfecting your equipment properly, your risk is really low. That is a good point, Paul. Um, but if you're immunocompromised in any way, you do have a higher risk. And a lot of these cases that are reported are either individuals that are um, young children um, and or they're uh, people that are elderly or in some way immunocompromised or undergoing chemotherapy. They have active acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Uh, they've got diabetes. They've got some kind of underlying chronic disease that, that impacts their, their immune system and their ability to fight off these infections that normally wouldn't be a problem for us. So. The, the, thank you, Tim. Uh, of course, now with this pandemic, uh, we see uh, some groups being... Uh, fueled with a new ammunition uh, towards the trade in, in animals. Uh, um, any, any thoughts, uh, a viral disease like COVID-19, uh, cold-blooded animals and, and transmission to, towards humans? Uh, any, any 
signs are? I, I, I don't know of any any viral diseases that 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 would occur, um, and typically that is a rare. It would be extremely rare for something like that to occur because these viruses have evolved. Our viruses have evolved, or mammalian viruses have evolved to replicate at our body temperature. And so the viruses of cold-blooded animals have evolved to replicate and reproduce at those colder body temperatures. So they typically aren't gonna do well um, moving, making that big a jump. Now that's not to say, I mean, these are biological systems. That's not to say that we couldn't find something um, or something could emerge, but the risk of, I think, of viral diseases moving back and forth are pretty low. I mean, I, I think our biggest, our biggest risk that we need to worry about are the bacterial diseases. And of course, there are some parasitic diseases, but you usually have to eat the fish. Yeah. Uh, well, we got the herring, herring worm in, in Holland, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, is a helicopter flying over here. Sorry about that. Um, there's a herring, herring worm in, in Holland, which causes from time to time a bit of problem, which mainly is related to the fact that, that cleaning is poor. Uh, but you say the chance of, of from a cold-blooded animal towards humans is, is very slim? I would say so, based on the knowledge I have uh, for, for viral diseases, for viral diseases. That's what we need to, we need to think about. Um, I was going to get back to, you know, mycobacterium is, is really interesting. Uh, you know, our knowledge about mycobacteria in fish has stayed pretty constant over the years, but we're learning a lot more now because zebrafish are now being used as research animals for biomedical research. And so there's suddenly money to figure out how to improve the husbandry and how to understand the diseases um, that we see in zebrafish. And so we've learned a lot. There are a number of additional species of mycobacterium that we're finding. We're also finding that certain species can exist in a population of fish and not cause any problem whatsoever. And then there are others that if they're in the population um, can cause serious problems, not only for the fish population, but an increased risk to uh, the people that are taking care of the fish. Um, and, uh, and so we've learned a lot about managing them and they haven't done this for Michael yet, but for some other diseases, they've the zebrafish. Um, they call it. It's a research aquaculture industry is what they is what it's referred to now. They've really learned a lot about quarantine and biosecurity and how to create specific disease-free fish, and um, that's something that may at some point get to get get to a situation where it might be cost-effective to look at at eliminating um, some of these diseases from cultured populations. Um, we're not there with myco yet, but, but what is what I found particularly interesting with mycobacteria is the, the number of new species that we're finding and that some of these species don't really cause problems in healthy animals, whereas others, you know, the typical ones we think about, uh, mycobacterium chelonii, marinum, um, terrasii, those are all um, tend to cause serious problems in certain species of fish if it gets into the population, but then there are some other ones that they can get in there and they only find them incidentally. Mm -hmm. Prevention is better than treatment? Always. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm coming back to, to, uh, to where Capilla started uh, earlier is, is uh, I, if I understood it correctly, uh, a problem with UV lighting uh, sterilization within the system uh, cause mortality three to five days within uh, uh, within the rearing um, the system, um, would you would you consider it a treatable thing, or would you uh, would you focus on on prevention uh, in case of mycobacteria? I would focus. Are you asking me or Capilla? Okay, you you. Oh, um, I would focus on prevention because uh, a limit, uh, trying to eliminate it from a population is very difficult. We don't have drugs that are particularly. Um, effective at clearing it in fish. Um, I'm always looking for papers and that research that suggests there's something that that uh, can eliminate it. But in my experience, you can maybe you can control it, but you can't actually eliminate it from the population. And I've always wondered if if some of these protocols they're using in zebrafish, if a facility, a breeding facility, was really interested in trying to eliminate. A particular species of myco, if it could be done using some of the protocols they use, 
um, and they're really stringent. There's there's the facility I work with at Oregon State. Um, there are three levels of quarantine, and the fish that you bring in are not the fish that go into production. It's actually the F3s that go into production, and there's rigorous testing all the way through. Um, it would be expensive, but it would. I'm, I, I wonder if it could be done with myco. They haven't done it with myco yet in the zebrafish, but they've done it with a number of other um, uh, species of, of pathogens. The, is there a lot to learn for, for our industry from uh, aquaculture in general? Uh, you talked about specific uh, pathogen-free uh, uh, stock, for instance. If you look at uh, the industry of the shrimp, uh, shrimp con consumption shrimps, uh, edible shrimps, Panaeus vana, mayo, Panaeus vana, and where, where a white spot has been such a big issue. And you saw hatcheries, specific hatcheries uh, uh, gearing up for uh, specific pathogen-free uh, post larvae uh, for the market. Uh, of course, our industry is much smaller than, than uh, the whole of our industry is much smaller, I think, than, than the, the shrimp industry. Uh, but I think there's a lot to learn uh, from that. Uh, would you I, would like to that? I would agree. I think that, uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from food fish, and I'm using fish broadly, including shellfish. Um, I think there's a lot we can learn from that industry. I also think that there's a lot we can learn from um, the zebrafish industry, um, which has really become an industry now. I don't, you know, many, many people know that the original zebrafish actually came out of the pet trade, but now there are all these different lines that have been created and it, and it's an, an industry, um, on its on its own now and there are we have a we have a production essentially a production facility on our campus there's another one south of us there's um, many in germany there's some in singapore and they're producing all these fish and they're they're essentially producing these fish in closed recirculating systems and they've and they have all this money because it's biomedical research um, and they've learned a lot that i think can be applied to our industry and some of it may not be cost effective at this point, but at some point um, it may be, but there's certainly a lot we can learn about managing mm -hmm. disease um, in these populations. Cause they have lines of zebrafish that have, you know, a neg negligible immune system, very little or no immune system. And yet they're still able to rear and reproduce these fish. So I think there's, there, that's another industry I think we could learn a lot from. And if, you know, if you try to keep up on some of the literature, delving into the food fish aquaculture literature literature and the zebra fish literature, I think is really worthwhile. I've learned a lot um, about managing fish populations in our, our cold water marine systems just from the zebra fish world. You as, as a veterinarian, um, if, well, medical science in general, if, you, if we go to humans, uh, we will see a, a specialist on each on an organ level. Uh, if you go to animal husbandry, you'll probably have a specialist on on poultry or, or cattle. Uh, and then we're coming to the aquatics, uh, where we have a specialist for all fish and shrimps. Uh, are we still underdeveloped? Underdeveloped? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. I th I think most of us. Uh, I think within aquatics. You, you do see some specialization, but the specialization is usually, I work, uh, there's a veterinarian, veterinarians that work on marine mammals, and then there's the veterinarians that work on the fish and the invertebrates. And um, it's still pretty, I, I guess I, I would be a fish and invertebrate guy. And um, I, I think we all pretty much consider ourselves to be general practitioners of, of the fish world. There aren't really any of us that that really specialize too much. I mean, there are some that we know, you know, if you've got to do surgery on a really expensive animal, well, you want, you know, we know, we, you know, I don't want to do that, but I have, th I know this person who's really a, a really good surgeon. Um, we'll sometimes bring in specialists from other, other sub-disciplines in veterinary medicine. So I'm dealing right now with some serious eye conditions that are, that are, um, confounding me. And so I'll bring in a veterinary ophthalmologist to actually work with me on that. But we're still, you know, 
they, they will say, well, if this was a cat, I would be thinking this and this and this, and then I've got to think about that in terms of the fish eye, and then how do we we come together on it? But I would say we're not we're not specialized to that point yet. Final question. Uh, they start to renovate the house here, so I'll <laughs> I'll switch off the microphone after this one. Um, one health uh, antibiotic use. Uh, could you comment on that? OFI uh, members are, are we, in our charter. Uh, we ask our OFI members uh, uh, to limit the use of antibiotic and preferably not to use antibiotics. Uh, um, how, how, in your opinion, is is it, it is a very general uh, question, of course. How, in your opinion, the ornamental fish sector uh, sees the use of antibiotics? Uh, do they use it too easy? Uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah, I think I think uh, we go to antibiotics too quickly, often before we've fully diagnosed the problem. And um, I can tell you that I was certainly guilty of that when I first got involved. And the more I've learned and the more comfortable I've been um, with understanding the disease and the populations I work with, I, I tend to um, I tend to use antibiotics less and less now. But I do think that it is overused um, and it's overused in other industries too. But, um, and I see a lot of antibiotic resistance in bacteria I pull out of fish. So we did a, we did a study, oh gosh, I don't know how many years ago it was. Um, and uh, where we looked at fish coming in from South America and from Asia, and we looked at what, what did we isolate? What bacteria did we isolate from the fish? And then what was the resistance pattern? And it was, it was surprising. I think we had, I'm trying to remember the numbers, it's been a while. Um, I think we had something like 62 isolates out of, and this was a small study out of maybe 50 fish. We just sort of randomly selected fish. And every single one of those isolates um, and when I say isolates, there are different species of bacteria that we were able to grow up out of these fish. Every single one of those isolates was resistant to at least one antibiotic. Most of them were resistant to multiple antibiotics. Are, are and, antibiotics uh, too cheap? And, and uh, are we using, or are people using that for, to mimic uh, or to, to cover up uh, poor husbandry? Um, oftentimes, yes, yes. I think we use, I think oftentimes we do use antibiotics as a crutch and we need to avoid that. Um, and antibiotics aren't the only thing we use as a crutch. I think, you know, I've seen situations where, you know, uh, UV and ozone has been used as a crutch to, because, the, because there, there isn't the human capacity or the, the whatever the resource is missing to just do proper cleaning of the water and management of the water. So they use UV or ozone to, to keep the water clean instead of do the, the husbandry work that's necessary. And I'm not saying, the, saying those are, aren't valid ways to approach problems, but I think sometimes we do use antibiotics and some of these other things as crutches um, for, poor, to, for poor husbandry. But again, that's my opinion. And I, I know there are people that will disagree with me, but. Uh, well, if you have 10 farmers, you probably have 10 different opinions on, on, on of each course. issue to bring to the table. Uh, but, and, but antibiotic resistance, uh, uh, bacterial resistance against antibiotics is, is a serious problem, uh, which, will, uh, which we have to address, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons why OFI in its charter uh, asks or dictates its members uh, uh, to refrain uh, the use of antibiotics. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your comments, uh, Tim. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. One minute. Uh, uh, give me a minute, Tim. Uh, yes, I would like to inform all the uh, uh, participants. Uh, we were supposed to hear Michael Chekinadi from USA. Uh, uh, he was supposed to talk live to all of you, address all of you. But uh, there was a bad windstorm in his area. He could not join us. So we were discussing about uh, some issues, relevant issues. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tim Miller Morgan was a lady, and we were all discussing about the uh, present relevant uh, trade issues and uh, further issue things. Uh, well, uh, there are a couple of questions coming up in the uh, YouTube live. Uh, Chamara Mahagame uh, asked Dr. Tim, could you tell us about 
Odinium in freshwater fish, we're facing in beta fish fry currently, mostly, okay, sometimes occurring cleaner tanks also. What is the best answer for this Odinium? Thank you. Boy, um, I'm gonna, I would also open this up to others to, to throw, to, um, um, put in some suggestions too. So I'm reading this, you're having the Odinium problems are in the, the fry cultures. My, I guess my first question been, are you actually identifying o Odinium um, in those animals? Um, that, that would be a, a, a question that I, that I would have to make sure that you're actually, it is in fact o Odinium. It's a dinoflagellate. They can be really difficult to treat. Um, we again work with prevention. You know, we try to quarantine our animals when they come in. Um, we'll use UV on the systems to con to control it. Um, and um, in in terms of of medications, I think some of this it, it for us it really varies. Some of the medications work and some don't, and that's why we've really w moved towards um, trying to focus on on prevention quarantining our animals, if we identify it, treat them in quarantine, but also just making sure our animals are clean before they move into the main population. Um, okay. Hopefully that answered your question. I see another one here that's fine put up. Um, some fish farms are facing disease problems, uh, stomach problems in the fish. Is there any treatment? Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's tough for me to answer because I don't really know what the problem is. Uh, and one of the, that is a without, without understanding what the problem is, what I would want it, what I would, the way I would typically approach something like this is, is I would do a necropsy or an autopsy on a fish that's just died, or I would euthanize one. And if, if it's stomach problems, I would really focus on the, the stomach and the gastrointestinal tract and see, you know, am I seeing, um, increased levels of, um, a lot of times I'll see flagellates or roundworms and, um, and, and then go from there. But it, this is general enough that, that I'm, I, I can't really give you a specific answer because uh, we would really need to work the animals up. Now, the question is without a veterinary doctor, uh, you can learn how to do um, these necropsies and autopsies on the fish and then most everybody's got a cell phone now and you can actually use that that phone and take images through a microscope and i think anyone who's serious about rearing fish um, really should get a microscope and learn how to use it and what's really nice is once you've done that you you, you will begin to recognize what doesn't belong <laughs> under the scope when you scrape a fish or look at a piece of the stomach or the intestine and if you if you recognize that it doesn't belong there, then you get you can take a picture or a video of it and send it to to someone, send it to a veterinarian or a fish pathologist. Um, so even if you don't have a veterinary doctor available locally, uh, there are still a lot of resources out there that you can send um, images to or pictures to. And if you can afford it, you can even send them to a diagnostic lab for a workup. I know our diagnostic lab will will receive fish from pretty much anywhere. I think we have, we have permits to receive fish from most countries and um, you know, we can work it up. Obviously there's gonna be a price to that, but we can work those fish up. So I can't really comment specifically other than the, ge the generality of focusing on looking at the stomach in a recently dead animal or a, one you've euthanized. Um, but there are resources out there even if you don't have a veterinarian available to you. Paul. Can, I comment? Can sure. I comment? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember uh, working for a wholesale company, important uh, fish species uh, going in large numbers. We would mm -hmm. always have multiple suppliers for, for such a species. And, and what we do, we would just grade uh, according to the performance uh, of these fish within our fish house. Now, generally, mm -hmm. fish would stay two to three weeks, I think more three weeks in our fish house before they would leave the purposes and go to the customer. And within that time frame, we would check each and every tank. Uh, you might have 100 tanks of a certain fish species coming from two or three different suppliers. Which one is performing best? And, and things like oodinium would, would pop up um, uh, strongly correlated uh, to a certain supplier. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm 
Vince, it, it goes back, it's not just the fish species, which is like, you know, uh, susceptible to a certain disease, but a, a fish species is susceptible to a certain disease because of the husbandry system it comes from. And, and our understanding, uh, the, the salmon industry has been an industry which is, has been a lot around for a long time and knows uh, there's a lot of uh, research on nutrition, uh, what a fish actually needs in what quantities. And still in the salmon industry, if you, if you look at a, a salmon from a, from a cage, uh, a cultured uh, cage, or a wild caught salmon, uh, and you, you put a, a, a fillet of each on a plate and look at it, at what you're getting, uh, you, you see two completely different fish species. Uh, mm -hmm. Salmon in oh, very much so. Up, uh, towards growth. Uh, in our industry, we, we use quite a lot of uh, uh, aquaculture feed, which is geared up to growth, and not specifically geared up to ornamental uh, beauty, uh, resilience, strong, being able to travel around the world from one water type to the other water type. Uh, so there's still a lot to learn, I think. And um, I agree. Uh, husbandry is, is a, a, a very important part uh, in this industry. Oh, I agree completely. And I mean, I would just echo what you said. We, we did a lot of work with um, a Im big importer down in, in California and we would see that we could trace problem species to specific suppliers and the issues would go away if they switch suppliers. And then what we would do in this situation is sometime if the supplier had a particular range of species that the company liked, then we would work more closely with them to try to improve the quality. And that might even involve sending, sending some people to that facility uh, to work with them. But, uh, I, I would agree. It's 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 not just the species that's susceptible. It's you've got to look at what's setting those animals up to be susceptible to the disease, and usually it comes back to husbandry. Kind of a joke that I have when, with with clients that I work with is, um, and and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, a little bit of a joke, but I will say, look, if I come in and I'm working with you guys and I actually have to work as a veterinarian and treat something, then we failed somewhere. And it's not that we're bad husbandry people. It's just that we may not know enough about this animal or the origin of this animal. And so we've got to work that out. So I always say that my job is to work myself out of a job. Hasn't happened yet, but it, it's a dream. <laughs> Either an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I mean, uh, <laughs> try to avoid getting a veterinarian is, is the most yeah. important task for any man, right. I think. Yeah. And I think, you know, the majority of our problems are related to husbandry. And it, it's just, we've sometimes got to figure out where that, where that issue is. Did you have something that's fine? Yes, uh, I think that we are now approaching what is both the strength and the weakness of the ornamental fish industry compared to, for instance, the, the salmon industry, that we have so many small scale breeders with limited resources which means that they do not have the economy or the knowledge to do as much as a big player would have. But on the other hand, they are also the, the, the consequences of diseases when you have many small scattered farms is not the same as if you had one gigantic farm. So, so uh, it, it's, in many ways, an industry which is very different from, from the large scale commercial aquaculture that we see, for instance, in you know, European and North American salmon farming. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. And that's, you know, that's where, uh, as, as we were talking about earlier, I think that, you know, aqua, we can learn a lot from aquaculture, but I think an, um, a discipline where I think there's a lot that we can glean um, in terms of health management, particularly health management, but maybe even breeding um, is, is from the, what we call research aquaculture. Now the, the facilities that are producing, you know, millions of zebrafish and Madaka and, and a number of other of these species, uh, they, they have the money to do the research and mm. because they're working on human diseases. And so, I really think we can piggyback on them and and uh, and and learn from some of the things they're learning, uh, and they're they're turning out a lot of papers. 
संदर्भ में ठहरो पीछे आगा पीछे क्या आगे चल रहा है Any other questions, comments? I didn't really intend it to be a veterinary or a <laughs> animal health talk, yes. but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we thought the general issues in ornamental fisheries. Hello. Uh, you can you can unmute and talk. You can unmute and talk. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes, yes, Rida. Yes, Rida. Yeah, yeah I'm Rida awesome. from Mumbai. I just uh, was wondering if instead of using antibiotics, what are the prospects we can use any chemical antibacterials like say BKC, benzalkonium chloride, or like bronopol, etc. And where can we get any literature or uh, any references regarding this? Thank you. I there I know there are some facilities that are using some of these chemical treatments uh, to manage um, uh, certain diseases. I, I know of a couple of facilities, facility managers I've talked to are using say Vircon Aquatic to actually manage um, a couple a couple types of protozoal diseases, but it's again, I'm speaking as a veterinarian that has to maintain my license. Yes. It's completely off label. <laughs> it's yes. not approved. And I don't know that there's a lot of literature um, based on that. Um, you understand. Yeah. I think one area that I really think um, there's a lot of potential is, is looking at, at doing some real serious research at botanicals. And I mean, there's a lot out there on the market that people are buying, but there's not necessarily that much literature supporting it yet. But I think there's, I think there's a lot of potential there. The, the regulatory issues are certainly going to be less. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on it, but I know that something that it keeps coming up um, when we're doing workshops and webinars and people are really interested in that. Um, and I think there's some potential there. I don't know if anyone else would like to come. Oh, I see Paul. Yeah. Well, uh, to comment, actually, it, we're, we're got, returning back to where we started with Sven, uh, economy of scale is, 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 an, is a thing here. Uh, as our industry is so small, uh, none, none of the, the, the pharmaceuticals will ever invest, I think, in this industry, specifically targeting uh, ornamental fish. Uh, there, there are a number of companies, but economy of scale is so small that, that it's just not, not worth uh, pursuing it at this stage, I think. I think would agree. I know I was I was involved in um, the uh, one of the vaccines development of one of the vaccines for koi herpes virus, and you know I think it 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 was offered for about eight months in the United States, but it just the scale wasn't there for them to stay in it for the company to stay in it, and and that's that's a huge issue. And uh, as a remark to Paul. Um, and drifting a little bit away from the veterinary side of things, as Paul said, something very important with the with the small operators and things. Uh, I <clears throat> have very often problems recognizing the ornamental fish industry when I talk to our opposition, as in typically when someone outside of the industry is talking about it. It sounds like an industry made up of extremely wealthy, big players who earn tremendous amounts of money on this industry. Of course, there are some who make a lot of money, but they also rely on all the small farms, all the tiny micro businesses, uh, consisting of one man or one man and his family. And, and that's something that very few people outside of the industry realizes how important the ornamental fish industry is in small scale uh, businesses all across the world. It, this multi-million dollar industry, that's everything gathered together, but every small pl player has no way of fighting on a 
global international uh, level. And that's why we need international trade associations who understands this and can fight for them all combined. There is indeed a huge number of, of small farmers and, and, and worldwide in, in places in the world where there's limited other options to make a, a living. Uh, uh, we have to defend these people. We have to be there for them uh, to protect their livelihoods. I completely agree with you, Sven. Thank you. And I, I think what's interesting about that is, is that it's a hard story to tell. And, uh, you know, I... I I guess, and I, this is more of a question I put out, how do we tell that story better? How do we reach a broader audience? I know, you know, I, I co-lead these trips down to the Rio Negro with Scott Dowd and, you know, we'll have these hobbyists that'll come down and a lot of them, you know, they've known about the Project Piaba for a while and, 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 and they'll go down there, but they're just completely blown away when they get down there and suddenly realize all these little communities and the interconnections and, 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 how how fragile it can be and um you know they i think they had some impression of the well there's this one big export facility and they've got their fishers that just go out and then come right back and they don't realize this long chain and and uh and even the small places that you know one or two person operations that are breeding the fish um you know how, how do we get that story out how do we tell that story better i think is is it's a really important issue for the industry, in, in my opinion. Absolutely. Uh, could, you, could you highlight a bit, uh, elaborate a bit more on what you mean with fragile, uh, that we all understand that? Oh, oh, uh, you know, I, I look at with some of these, these villages, if, if, you know, in the early, in the 90s, at kind of the peak of the industry down there, you know, there was, there was maybe 2000 people, um, well, no, what was the number? It's like a thousand families, for instance, were making their making a, a decent living um, collecting these fish. And then, you know, there have been changes in the market, not necessarily related to overfishing or anything like that, which we've for many of these species, we've shown that doesn't seem to be an issue. But the changes in the market are just there. There's no demand for their fish anymore. And suddenly, you know, they have these families that were doing okay are now having to leave the jungle and move to the cities. And um, the, you know, this one, one village we work with, uh, there, there used to be a school there. Well, then the school got moved to another larger village. And so the kids have to transfer. And then um, there used to be, the priests used to come to all the villages. Now they all have to go to a central area. And this village, when I first went down there, there were probably 15 families that lived in the village. And then when I was down there two years ago, there were two and, and they've left and they've had to change industry. So that when I get to the fragility, that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't take much of a shift at the um, consumer end or the, the import end to actually have these ripple effects that actually are affecting communities and, and people, people that are living in, in many ways on the edge, or it doesn't take much to have them living on the edge. Yeah. No, and what has happened in, in uh, Brazil in particular, but also in other countries in South America with the loss of livelihoods because the industry is transferring, uh, transferring to captive breeding is, is quite dramatic for, for the livelihoods in the Amazon. On the other hand, if we should look positive on it, it also has positive effects for livelihoods in, for instance, Indonesia. And uh, when the cardinal tetras now are being bred in Indonesia, it's, it's not in gigantic facilities. Mm -hmm. It's again, small farmers who take up a, a micro loan uh, to, to build a tiny shed where they set up aquariums and they get some help to learn how to, to breed these, and then they supply the exporters. Uh, in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, I've, I've, I've visited so many small family businesses where, where uh, a husband and wife and teenage kids in practice are, 
are running a business that gives them more income than the average in the industry worker uh, income in, in the same country is. So um, th this, I, I agree with you, this is a message we need to get out about the industry, but it's extremely difficult to actually get it out. Gayatri, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Gayatri Lele has joined. Could you add to uh, what Swain Hello. mentioned about Cardinal Tetras? Yeah, hi. Hello, Gayatri. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying the, the, you know, the talk. So I, I did follow through the, the live uh, stream YouTube and I just joined in through the, the Zoom. Okay, could you uh, add to what Swain has, uh, was talking about regarding the, the sustainable fishery systems in uh, Indonesia? Well, the thing is, I, um, it's uh, the, sustainab the sustainability uh, um, concept. It's, it's now, it's not just a concept because uh, the government um, has... Um, uh what you call it encourage uh in in all industry basically about the sustainability and from the industry i mean not just uh, ornamental but the seafood industries the sustainability is now like um it's a pressure from the market but it's also they see that the the sustainability it's it has to become a norm in every uh, business practices now, when you talk about the, at the local level, at the producers, say at the fishers, they are, uh, uh, some of them already, you know, uh, adopt the sustainability through their best practices. And this is, we're talking about, you know, over 10 years now when, 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 when say I started to work on the Marine Aquarium Council. So. All right, Gaitri, all yeah. right. We'll yeah. take a break. We will all join at 1 p.m. Uh, Indian Standard Time. So Gaiti oh. will be elaborating about all this in her talk at 1 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Shall we close for time? Thank you very much, all of you, for joining the discussion. Thank you very much once again. We join at 1 p.m. sharp, right? Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Timila Morgan, Paul, Sreen Poza, <laughs> Gayatri, all of us chiming in. Thank you very much. We are joined at 1 p.m., right? Indian Standard okay. Time. Okay. Thanks. It's a very interesting discussion. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a bit. See you in a bit. See you, see you soon. Okay. Admin, please close the session. Thank you. The admins uh, can stop the session.